Hello and welcome to the episode 31 of the Full Funnel B2B podcast. And today we have a very special guest here, uh, Omar Mohut. And Omar is an ex SaaS CEO uh, with a su- successful exit. Uh, but for many years, he has been on board of many startups and scale ups of prominent companies like uh, Asoptra, Team Leader CRN, Digipolis Antwerp, and Let's Build. He's an entrepreneurship fellow at Cities and works as a guest professor at Entrepreneurship School of Antwerp. Of, 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 I'm sorry, guest professor of entrepreneurship at Antwerp Management School and Solvay Business School in Brussels. He's a founder or a mentor of many different uh, startup and scale up programs and platforms such as Scale Up Flanders, Founder Institute, Microsoft Innovation Center. Nestup, Imekai Start, and many more. Omar also wrote uh, various books on lean pricing, lean marketing, from idea to product market fit, crowdfunding in Belgium, corporate venturing, the Belgian startup landscape, and leaving a legacy and increasing your social impact. Um, I, I want to talk today with Omar about revenue scaling, growth in turbulent times, scaling your company internationally and the emerging trends Omar uh, sees in B2B marketing 2021. Omar, welcome to our show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, Vladimir. Much <laughs> appreciated. It's awesome to have you. I'm really excited to have you here as a guest. And, you know, like I said, you've successfully scaled and sold your own B2B uh, SaaS startup and have been a board member of and a mentor of many other startups and scale-ups. And in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges that you see with scaling revenue of B2B, let's say, complex uh, sales uh, kind of startups? It's a very good question to, to start with. Uh, I mean, to put it in, in perspective, uh, Vladimir, um, challenges coming always back to um, uh, talent, funding, and go-to-market. Uh, and scaling revenue is uh, go-to-market and also partly uh, related to funding and talent. Assuming that you have... Um, post-product market fit that you manage to have something where there's a market for it, it's validated by the market. We see that uh, very often in terms of go-to-market, um, we are, um, especially in B2B, we are underestimating a marketing. So often what people do is think, okay, you need some more headcount and they're going to do it. Eh? In enterprise sales, long sales cycles, uh, it will take six to 18 months to get where you want to get. Um, and especially, specifically in Europe, uh, people don't buy um, um, SaaS solution online for 10,000 euros a month. In the US, you have that. But in Europe, they want to see your face, they want to talk to you, they want to have that kind of personal uh, approach. And that makes it extremely hard to scale actually your go to market. Yeah? Because if you want to scale the company, you also have to scale your revenue machine at the end of the day. And that's a struggle everybody has. So in the beginning, you have founders uh, let sales, people do that and they, it works somehow. And then they try to hire somebody and things don't get replicated. So they hire somebody from uh, Oracle or uh, one of Microsoft who will replicate whatever they learned over there to the company. So it's actually um, a mess. Uh, now, why is it a mess? Is because um, they are, the challenge for them is to go from uh, successful activities, experiments that worked out in the past to try to make it a machine. So to come from something where they have been lucky, you did something good, and then they try to create a machine around that. It's a new uh, new skill, don't have experience with it uh, as being founders. And what we see is you don't have a machine. Uh, you have part of a machine, but very few times I see this really is being engineered as a machine. Okay, it makes a lot of sense. So um you mentioned that it's a real struggle to get let's say the good team together and uh even the proven experience in enterprise sales doesn't even guarantee that they will be performing well in a startup so what do you think is an ideal team structure for successfully scaling revenue in b2b tech companies it's, um, that's indeed the one million dollar question i would say um uh, I would argue that um, your team has to uh, mirror and replicate what you're doing in the sales funnel. So your sales funnel is really telling you what you have to do in terms of th- team structure. I'll give you an example. In B2B, you make a choice 
to go direct or to go indirect or a combination, right? So you're using partners or not. Obviously, um, people think uh, often when they go for an indirect partner model that automatically your partner will do all the work for you. Yeah? I mean, it's so, so wrong. At the end of the day, you have to do all the work. You have to generate the leads, you have to give them the leads and you hope they're gonna close it for you. That's already an achievement um, in the first stage. So um, you, to do that, you need to make sure that you have a team which reflects uh, your approach and your sales funnel. That's the first thing. So you build your sales funnel and the first mistake is people think there's only one sales funnel. They're not. Every channel is a sales funnel which you aggregate into one big one. It can be uh, online marketing, can be SEO, SEO, it can be exhibition, can be phone call, but one way or another, they will come back to um, the big aggregation of the sales funnel. So your team reflects, first of all, the sales funnel. And the second thing is it's been driven by cost of sales. Uh, if you're selling uh, a product at five euros a month, um, it'd be very hard to do a sales call and go and visit somebody. Uh, if you're asking 10,000 a month, you can fly to the US even and do a pitch and come back. So the sales funnel structure and uh, building it up, and remember this more than one coming together should be reflected by the activities of your team and therefore your team structure. And the second big constraint is um, to make sure that cost of sales is driving what you can do or not. Uh, depending how much you can spend, you have more or less options to um, put a team on it uh, or not. Okay, you nailed it, I <laughs> love it. And um, you, you spoke about the team and growing the team and the team structure, um, but you've also, let's say, been a mentor or you know, founded or uh, participated in these kind of different kind of programs for uh, coaching education of, uh, of, of teams within scale-ups and startups. So what do you think, uh, what kind of help or advice in your opinion is most effective for B2B revenue contributing teams? Yeah, again, it's, um, it's an excellent uh, question. I mean, basically what, uh, what we see is, um, if you look to, to um, the sales funnel or revenue funnel, whatever you wanna call it, is top of funnel is always driven by marketing. That's a given. And then is the question what you do in the middle and what you do in the end. Uh, very likely at the end, you, in B2B enterprise sales, there's probably somebody involved uh, um, as a person. Um, so traditionally you have uh, marketing and sales that come back in the middle and at some point there is a handover. Usually the handover is what you call qualifying leads. Um, qualified leads has a lot of meanings, but usually people using bands. Uh, so lead needs to have a budget, an authority, a need within a certain time frame, and it should fit your solution, more or less. So it depends on the definition. At some point, you hand over from marketing to sales. Now, what we see today is that marketing is eating the sales funnel. So we're pushing more to the right. If you go from left to the right, eh? you remember how you, you're driving the sales funnel uh, or from top to, to bottom. So sales gets less and less involved. It's more and more marketing driven. So you need to have new marketing skills, not just people who can generate leads, but who know how to close. Now, you're an expert in that. I mean, uh, lead generation, that's very important. Uh, it's um, the start of everything, of the journey to your customer, but you also need to be closing online. And today, uh, thanks to Corona, people are more at home. People realize that they also have to go a step further, not just being happy like we have a lead, uh, we call them to maybe qualify and done, you really try to make sure that they can also close in there. So I would say the new area in, um, especially in Europe, uh, in, in, in marketing skills is how do you close a deal, whatever it's 5,000 or 100,000 deal, as much as possible online. And that's something which is a new area. So I would argue that um, top of funnel, everybody's busy on that. There's a lot of things and, um, and there are a lot of skills and experience in the last 10 years. Um, uh, the end of the game, the end game that says involved is also playbook. Everybody knows uh, uh, the middle is where the friction happens. Uh, how do you do that? But that's shifting to the to the right. I mean, making marketing even more dominant. But there you need to have the skills of how do you go from a qualified lead to closing it as much as possible by marketing, i.e. online and having less salespeople involved. It makes a lot of sense. I agree 100%. And this is what we see, especially like, you're talking about complex B2B sales, uh, expensive products, complicated, multiple people being involved. 
um, there are not a lot of people who know exactly how to, let's say, help the sale from the marketing perspective, how to nurture and feed the leads and move them through the funnel. Speaking of, of uh, complex sale, and I know a lot of companies, and I remember also you in, in when I, I heard some of your talks, and you were also always explaining how you should start in your primary market, and you should understand how to sell before going abroad. But I see that a lot of companies are struggling with that next step. So going from there, let's say primary home market to abroad. So what, what is the process that you would recommend for scaling a B2B company internationally? Yeah, uh, it's one of the elements indeed companies struggle with um, as such. What I see is uh, you have to do first your homework, which is top down. Look to some numbers, look to a potential market, see what the penetration is there, what's the competition there. So you're looking for numbers driven top down approach. Uh, that's less like you do a business plan or a financial plan for your business as such. We all know the plan is wrong, we know that, but you still have to make your homework, right, to, to get there. So the first thing, um, if you do that, um, you have to realize like any business plan, whatever you formulate there, and it can be really like sophisticated with a number of parameters and penetration and cloud, uh, all these things, you might do a great job, but everything in there, Vladimir, is an assumption. You have to be realizing everything that you wrote down there is an assumption. So the next stage is how do you validate that, which is the bottom-up approach. And in my experience, one of the best ways to do that is to combine landing pages for the specific language or target group that you want to target in your business plan or international plan um, as such, with um, spending something on SEA. Because you cannot wait uh, two years of SEO and get picked up as such. You want to have quick results to validate. Uh, the combination of creating uh, landing pages is quite relatively cheap. Uh, in there, um, like I said, is uh, targeting a certain group, um, can be a country, can be a region, can be a certain segment, and combine that with uh, fueling and paying um, Google or whoever other uh, channel that you're paying for to get your traffic there and see if people indeed convert into a lead and then probably at some point it sells. So that's the combination going top down, make your homework uh, very analytical and see uh, whatever is possible there. And then you validate it by bottom up um, as such. And their landing page is extremely powerful um, to really test and validate your uh, assumption. And uh, do you think that there are very big differences between markets like going, let's say uh, you're, you're operating in Belgium and a lot of the companies that you advise are in Belgium and then going from Belgium abroad like what are the big differences that you see? Um, there is much more than we think. Eh? If you take, um, let's make it simple, look to Belgium, where I'm based, look to the countries around us. If you take um, the major countries in Europe, we talk about the UK, you talk about um, Germany and France. Um, for instance, the first thing happened if you go to Germany is question about privacy. Yeah. Where is the data? Is it uh, hosted in Germany or not? Uh, it's very specific to Germany to be... Um, perceived as a local company in Germany and in France is quite important. While in the UK, it's less important. You call from Belgium, people are open to that as such. So already you see that the approach in very close countries to us, a proximity makes a difference. The, the other thing is um, sometimes, uh, I mean, what works in one country will be a weak point in another one or a strong point in there. In some countries, they it's a condition to speak the local language, to speak there with the local language uh, as such. But other countries feel people feel honored that they speak another language with them, speak English with them, it's like, oh, I feel important and uh, in there. So uh, again, um, um, it's true, business is business. At the end of the day, it's about how much you're doing, pay you, what's the return on that? It's true, analytical, you cannot go beyond that. Eh? You pay amount of money and you get uh, much more back in value, of course. But how you package it, how you position it, which is marketing at the end of the day, is really makes a difference between a successful growth engine and something which is maybe good enough, but not as optimized for international uh, impact. Okay, it makes a lot of sense. And um, so let's say this year, unfortunately, has been tough for a lot of companies and uh, many industries have suffered. Well, at the same time, I, in, I believe, you know, kind of like put a shed a light on some of the weaknesses and strengths of some of the companies that you mentor, I'm sure. And could you maybe share some of the insights? Uh, like what are 
what made the biggest difference in companies who did well or still managed to grow or preserve, let's say, their growth rate in these times and those that didn't? Um, it's very hard to make a general statement about that, Vladimir, for every company applicable. But what I see is um, it's very hard to acquire new customers. So uh, something to look into, although everybody's trying it uh, and adapting um, uh, given the circumstances. So um, a good thing to do is to look for um, quick wins. And typical, they are lying within your existing customer base, which means upselling, cross-selling, and lastly is pricing. Don't forget revenue is the number of customers paying a certain price. Uh, so the whole time we talk about number of customers acquiring them, but you can also look to price to increase your revenue uh, in there. I mean, and today um, a price increase of let's say uh, one percent is not a big thing you can easily um, offer that to customers although you have to make sure there's a value against that uh, of course but one percent in top line um, uh, growth like, so, so revenue growth means probably mean that you have 10 percent more in bottom line and today bottom line counts because that's the cash that comes in to pay the bills so i would uh, argue that uh, looking into upselling cross-selling and pricing for your existing customers is a strategy everyone today has to look into it uh, again okay and uh, it's interesting because now you kind of like also put a light it's not just about let's say marketing and getting new leads it's about also getting more out of the existing customer base but it's also looking at your price so if you're looking at a growing your revenue you have more levers that you can pull than just let's say pouring more uh, leads on top of the funnel right Absolutely. Um, fighting churn, all the things which will keep your customers um, and get your cash is today for everybody more important than ever. While you go to market, my might, might have to adapt uh, and to be slowing and you have low, lower growth because of that. That's something every company has to struggle with in their own way and finding answers to that. But a refocus on existing customer base from all the points I described is to me a given for everyone in that situation. Okay. And uh, maybe just to wrap it up, uh, what would you say are some emerging trends for B2B marketing in 2021? Uh, if only I knew, uh, Vladimir. <laughs> I have no crystal ball. But um, surely uh, I would say in the next year, more than next year, um, uh, what will really play a role are, um, is a shift in technology. AI is without any doubt, wherever there is data, AI will play a role. Uh, as such, whether you can use to find new customers uh, as such or understand your customers better, that's going to play a role in, in marketing in a very broad sense. There's so much public data available. It's, um, it's a paradise. Eh? If you're an analytical marketing person, it's really a paradise. You can play with a lot of data and the tools getting um, easier and better. It's, uh, it's amazing what's happening on that side, uh, I, would, uh, I would say. And the second, I guess, um, we all know that the future will be hybrid. We're not going to go back to the real world like it was before, where we will uh, work more from home. We will have less uh, physical distance. I mean, that we're going to exhibitions, at can it. So I would uh, argue that uh, maybe not by next year, but in the longer term, ER and VR will play a role that in a virtual way, we can go to an exhibition, exchange. You see today already things happening, but not mainstream. So AI in the short term, longer term, uh, VR will play a role uh, for marketing. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Omar. This is a great way to end the session. Uh, much success and uh, hope to speak to you soon. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you. Bye. Bye.